Hi. Hello. How was, uh, how was lunch? I believe a lot of people wanted to come to this talk, but the lines are too, too long, right? Yeah, yeah, you can tell that. This is what I do. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. This is a talk where I will be uh, talking, maybe showing some of the code stuff. Um, a lot of hate to YAML will be in this code if you, um, um, for this type of entertainment, so you're in the right room. Uh, my name is Victor. I work at a company called Confluent. And uh, how many of you heard about Confluent, actually? All right, a few people. So for those of you who don't know, and for the record, Conf uh, Confluent um, is a company that uh, we do all things Kafka, essentially. Uh, the company was started by people who started Kafka, so we do a lot of things uh, with Kafka, and uh, we also help to sponsor some of the open source development of Apache Kafka. But here, today, I'm not going to talk much about Kafka, at least this talk. I have another talk in uh, 3 o'clock-ish where I will be talking about Kafka specifically. Today I'm going to be talking about um, things, um, yeah, about different things. So essentially, uh, I will be doing ruffling stuff. If you want to tweet about this talk, uh, don't forget to mention there. Um, and after that, um, for my second talk, I have, a, I have a Kafka cluster running and I can pick, uh, I can pick a, a winner for this ruffle. All right. So, uh, and today I'm going to be talking on uh, evolution of um, YAML, evolution of uh, uh, some sort of automation scripts in your organization, right? Um, since we're going to be talking about YAML, uh, we'll see how we can like fix this uh, situation where we're going from, from some primates into this uh, Homo erectus DevOps person. So, the way how we start usually, um, we we just downloading something and we're running these binaries. Uh, we start the binaries uh, by double clicking on this one, or we can run some SH script, which is not technically true. There's there's some scripts, but there's no YAML. You're not doing any uh, declaration, so to speak. You're, you're running your applications. Over the time, you start embracing this uh, concept of like infrastructure as a code, declaring your infrastructure rather than you know, writing the scripts to telling what to do. So once you have uh, the frameworks like uh, Ansible, you get the things like uh, declaring your uh, fleet of machines, what kind of dependencies needs to be there, how to provision these dependencies, you don't specify. These things that you don't specify because the framework will take care of this. For example, installing some uh, uh, RPM packages or installing some uh, some binaries by downloading is nice. You're not specifying this because you're just using some of the declarations. Now, these days, people run things in um, in Kubernetes. How many of you running Kubernetes in production today? Okay, few people. Um, trust me, in uh, 2020, you will be running something on Kubernetes in production. Regardless, if you will keep your existing job, Kubernetes will come to you, or you will switch the job, it will go somewhere where Kubernetes will be the thing, and you will be doing this. Because um, I can say it's my confirmational bias because I'm talking a lot about Kubernetes things, and I can see people using this, but also when I'm working with some customers, a lot of big organizations, they're looking the ways how they can migrate to the kind of or to orchestrated environments. Rather than like building VMs uh, themselves, everyone wants to build um, orchestrated environments. Now, where we want to be? This is where I'm trying to answer in this presentation. So what's going to be this, uh, um, at least like one of the latest uh, steps in evolution of this uh, um, you know, person. All right, so there's a, I'll show you some slides that I found on the internet, I think it's funny. Uh, and I want to share with you. Uh, for some of the people, it can cause some pain. Uh, do you have any like Python people? Okay, one person. Okay, good. Because like uh, indentation is also a big problem. So when you start doing YAML, you're learning that YAML is a declarative language, and the YAML is very sensitive on to indentation. So in, in order to write the proper YAML, you need to have a ruler so you would know that all these nested elements are properly in uh, you know have a proper indentation. Um, and this is a big thing. So this is this is huge uh, because. Without proper tooling, without proper ID, it would be very easy to make some, some errors like this. Um, 
Another thing that we have in 2019-2020 uh, is the, apart from the DevOps engineers, now we have uh, YAML engineers. Um, there's kind of, this joke has actually two points because DevOps engineer, it's also kind of joke. Um, there, there's no DevOps engineer. So either a system administrator or a site reliability engineer, but DevOps engineer, it's like, I don't know, uh, some philosophical, <laughs> mythical person. And it's, anyway, so we have, a, we have a spe specially trained people who know how to write proper YAML. Um, they may be using rulers, maybe they have a very good eye on uh, like aligning these things, but hey, this is the real stuff. It actually was taken from uh, some, of the, uh, some of the companies um, and it was like found, the, the, the job, job, uh, job, job uh, description is still available if you can look for um, YAML engineer position, you can find apply. Now, another thing, it's also another piece of YAML, and this is more advanced YAML. It's already uh, uh, YAML that came from people that already know a few tricks. They already uh, went through this, you know, ruler exercise. They can do this kind of stuff. So what they're trying to do, they start introducing things like conditions. So you're introducing condition in a language that was created uh, as to be in declarative, right? You're putting some of the logic inside of declarative uh, statement. But uh, to be fair, it's actually not YAML itself. Um, it is a uh, fragment of uh, Helm chart. So Helm, it is a kind of the standard of packaging your applications, but essentially it doesn't package anything because it's not binary thing. It is just a template and there's a template engine that injects certain values into your template. But as a result, you don't have a software. As a result, you're getting YAML. So think about this. You're already going through this uh, step where you have a declarative thing, and now you need to generate declarative thing through some, some sort of like a templating thing. Another thing that you also might be uh, noticing here is this. What the hell is this? So now we're also mixing a declarative component of YAML that's supposed to be kind of like you declare your environment with actual um, imperative things, right? You, you're putting the shell script inside your YAML file. And the cool thing about this is that it's very difficult to validate what is going on here unless you did this before. So this is how our modern DevOps looks like these days, right? How many of you have seen this like in real life? Uh, we are in the safe like room here, you know, with friends here. So you can you can tell, yes, I've seen this. I know people. I know people. <laughs> I was a part of the team who wrote this Helm chart, and I can yes, uh, I'm Victor, and I'm uh, I write YAML and shell scripts, and things like that. So yeah, this is this is crazy. <sighs> Just like let this uh, sink in. Another thing that apart from the being, okay, so I'm just doing things, I'm writing things, there is a thing that came from, hey, IBM. Um, and this is actually like YAML definition of uh, Tacton, which is kind of like a new generation CI, CD, pipeline thingy. And look at this. <laughs> you have a YAML with the built-in shell scripts, you're injecting some of the, um, API keys and things like from somewhere else. So it's not, it's also another templating thing. Um, how we end up here? Like, <laughs> so what is that? How we will call this? Like YAML with bash scripts? You know, this is, uh, this is something that, um, you know, life uh, didn't prepare me for this. You know, when, when I was saying, oh, I will be doing computer stuff, right? The computer science stuff. No one tell me that, like, after I'm learning assembly, C++, C Sharp, Java, I will be learning how to write Bash inside my YAML file. So let's do a quick recap why and how we end up here. So like why, before we were trying to like fix this problem and see like what kind of problems we were trying to solve by introducing this uh, monstrosity and abomination of uh, text files. So let's start with the, uh, on the very beginning. So YAML was introduced in what, in 2001? Um, and according to like public sources, aka Wikipedia, um, it was named as the yet another markup language. It's not another, I don't know, like a programming language or whatnot. It's a markup language. You define some sort of markups, right? Um, <laughs> 
But interestingly enough, it was uh, repurposed in the now official name uh, YAML <laughs> ain't markup language, which is, um, so what is this then? Commonly used for configuration file. So you've seen these days, like if you go to, um, I don't know, like modern CI CD server, you can grab this uh, CI CD server configuration. Some of them CI CD servers that don't have UI, but only way how you can communicate to this CI CD server through the writing configuration file, YAML file. And it's fine. Uh, as long as you can fit this on the screen and you understand what is going on there, and you understand what you're doing, you're starting build, this is what your dependency is, this is, uh, this is what you're running, that's it, it's good to go. So we're declaring something. we actually specifying that this is what might be, and after that, the interpreter and the, the system that will be responsible for making things happen will make things happen for you. So you're not sending this kind of um, um, signals like do this my way, because you don't know uh, like how do, do, uh, do these things. And the saddest thing that it's so popular or so widespread that it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So what you can say, oh, Victor, you just like you creating this drama for nothing. You know, maybe there's not a big deal of this. So yeah, we do have a, like different tools. We, we, we were generating some of the templates that we have a like gazillion of different templatings on purpose because some of them would look bad. But this is the part where the thing's getting really, really interesting. So this is the part of this um, the Travis CI uh, GitHub issue tracker where, um, some of user will try to do upgrade from version 1.0, or sorry, 1.9 to version 1.10. And because the parser, the, the way how the parser works, it cannot, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it doesn't have types, so it parses everything as a string, and after that, based on this interpreter, how this will interpret the string, it will turn this into some number. So essentially, the instead of interpreting this 1.10 as a, as a number, it interpreted this as a string, and after that, when the string was converted to number, it just throw away uh, this uh, the zero at the end. So <laughs> instead of upgrading to from uh, 1.9 to 1. 0.10, we downgrade it to 1.1. It is like, it is a thing. You know, you can go and see this is an uh, issue that you can see and what, what was going on. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, you can say, hey, um, this stuff could be, could, be, uh, could be handled by different tools. You can use linters. Like, uh, you can have a, um, like, every time you save, you can run some process that will do linting and check everything, check indentation for you. However, um, linters don't help as well. Here's the problem. This is something that like you see uh, sometimes when you have a improperly um, uh, like uh, the formatted YAML and your linter actually gives up. So <laughs> because it says, I, I don't, I'm not doing this shit anymore, so just give up too many years. I don't know what to do. So there is a schema. So over the time, people realize, okay, so we need to have something so we can get do validation. But think about this. We have YAML, and now we need to apply JSON schema. So why not even start with JSON from the, the, for the first time? Like, because JSON, at least JSON has a, some notion of types because JSON came from the JavaScript, which is real programming language. You still can use JSON as a declaration. Now we need to remember this picture with the, uh, um, with the penguin and elephant. So we, we, we continue doing this. We're trying to marry technologies that are, were not you know, intended to be used. To. Yeah, we developers, we're doing this. It's called adapter pattern, right? Shut up, Victor. But think about this, like a conceptual, like why we keep doing this? And hey, we have a nice tools that can understand this. So for example, this is like screenshot from IntelliJ IDEA that uh, understands, um, how many of you use IntelliJ IDEA? How many of you use in, uh, I don't know, Eclipse? Okay, Eclipse also. Um, IDE. Um, the thing is, you have kind of like a work around this. But again, it's okay to use YAML for small things, um, uh, but like small things. But is it really intended to use for, for big things? And let's, uh, let's think about this, like, right? Um, 
Because the small things in our life, there's nothing small anymore. We have a large deployments. We're running big fleet of machines. We're running like some multiple deployments, multiple teams. We're embracing microservices now. Like every team has its own deployment thing. They need to have their own infrastructure. So, and how we, again, where we are with this one. So uh, people were bashing XML, um, though XML, I would say from the, one of the few attempts, XML and XML schemas, XML validation and uh, uh, XSD transformation, they did some things right, right? We, the, the, we used XML as a, as a technology for a very long time. Some, some people are still using XML and uh, probably they fine with that because they don't see a reason why they need to go to JSON on the first place because JSON didn't have a schema. Uh, JSON didn't provide you the right uh, ways to kind of like provide the, the, the types and, and things like that. Um, and now we have YAML. So question here. So question you need to start like if we, everyone's trying to sell us infrastructure as a code, why we're running so much YAML, right? So what are we gonna be doing with us? So today I'm gonna be showing you something that um, uh, I think it's a pretty good idea that covers some of the problems uh, that uh, we have with YAML. Um, I'm, this talk going to be like specific to uh, some Kubernetes deployments and specific to the things that um, important for like domain where I work. And uh, but the same ideas, same practices that uh, we implemented in this um, in this project. Um, that you can apply in uh, um, in a different domain by you know using tools like Kotlin. So um, just a quick overview for Kubernetes for you, so you will understand why some certain things are make sense here. So essentially, uh, Kubernetes uh, it's many things, and it depends on who you're talking to. Different person can explain you different things. It can say container orchestration thing. Uh, it can tell you this is a thing that manage my applications. Um, in my perspective, I like to see Kubernetes as a modern distributed uh, operating system. And uh, as a developer, I like to talk uh, through this operating system through certain APIs, like some of the SDKs that uh, allow me to, to talk to the system. So every time when you go to your command line and start typing uh, uh, um, kube control and uh, getting some information and resources, you issue a um, API call. When you're getting something back, you can get this in uh, different formats, but you get an API result. And you know what the funny thing, that uh, a lot of things that we do in Kubernetes is also related to, to, to YAML, right? How many of you actually, you know, have your deployment defined in YAML or your stateful sets? Yeah, you know funny thing? Funny thing is that API is actually JSON. So we do a transformation of this YAML on the client side and we still issue JSON request. We're getting this back to, uh, to the server side. On the server side, uh, Kubernetes does the thing and the result will be returned us as a JSON response that we can interpret as what? As YAML. So how we can uh, kill the middleman? You know, the YAML is definitely something is that, you know, some, something extra here. All right. So, um, and every time when you're trying to, another problem that uh, it's not YAML itself, because it's not uh, self-descriptive. Every time when you've seen some YAML file, you need to fetch some documentation to understand what particular field is, 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 uh, is required here. So what you do, you have a, on one screen, if you have a multiple screen in your, in your work, if you don't, if you work engineer, ask for a second screen, because this is how we need to work on 2020. You have a one to one screen, you have your ID, another screen, you have your documentation. In one screen, you're using uh, YAML to type things, and you're looking for documentation, what exactly you need to type. How many of you can relate to this? Again, we in this in the safe spot, you can you can you can you can you can freely express your, your sorrow. Now, same thing that we're trying to do. Okay, I want to write deployment. I wrote ton of deployments but I still need to go and look in documentation or I need to go and copy paste my YAML from somewhere else because um, it's just not easy to remember this for some reasons. I don't know, maybe I'm stupid, but like every time I need to go and fetch. And the first thing I'm doing Kubernetes YAML and after that, okay. And I have over a billion results um, and some of them may be not even relevant. So let's see what we want to have. What we want to have in our organization. So assuming we're running the scale, we already agree that for small things, YAML is okay for big things. So we want to avoid copy pasting. Sometimes copy pasting is good. Sometimes you copy pasting errors. 
which is also fine, <laughs> which is common. Um, we want to have a composability of our builds. For example, we have multiple teams that are running their microservices, but our operations team wants to have a certain control, so they want to have certain things that need to be done first in order to deploy certain things. For example, provision some dependencies and injecting some of the environment variables to the um, to, um, to this deployment. So we need to have some sort of like a common language that our operations people can talk to our developer people so that we can have this, you know, the conversation going and we'll have this like DevOps life. Um, so the, how we can provide uh, the ways how the teams can customize it. So instead of um, uh, just copy pasting this or forking this and after that we have a multiple force or the same Helm chart or, or some YAML file in multiple places, we want to have some of like a framework like approach where we can override things easier. Um, and uh, most importantly, like how you can uh, track and have this like incremental changes. Um, the another thing which is also pretty cool, uh, I also mentioned this sometimes we're not, we're not running our apps uh, in vacuum anymore. So our apps are running in some environment where we require some dependencies and it also would be cool that like our depend, uh, the deployment would be smart enough to go and uh, figure out certain like dependencies that our application will be using. For example, in my, 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 um, uh, my example that I'm showing you, I will be using uh, these um, APIs to discover uh, available Kafka cluster, so we inject this uh, environment variable into my application. So my application doesn't have to put hard-coded values for my uh, Kafka cluster. All right, so let's take a look on the small thing uh, that comes from the Kubernetes API, um, Kubernetes resource called Ingress. How many of you don't know what Ingress is? Okay. Ingress is a Kubernetes resource that allows you to define a uh, kind of sort of uh, the way how you can communicate to a service that will be running inside Kubernetes to outside world. In this particular case, Ingress will provision some sort of like an Nginx, uh, a Nginx pod. So it will expose certain, uh, certain application through this port to outside world so you can go and uh, click in the, the, the talk to this application. So this is common practice. This is standard API. So a couple things what we have here. We have this metadata section and we have this specification that actually defines what we're configuring. So a couple things here. We need to uh, know documentation in order to fill this, like what is important, what is required, what, is, uh, what, what we need to put here. And uh, here is how we can transform it into something that uh, can be self-descriptive, self-validated, and uh, all beautiful things that coming from, uh, from using modern programming language. So in this particular case, it still looks, um, you know, looks nice. We still have these blocks. This is what we kind of like in this declarative world because we can see this, okay, this is a block that we define certain things, blah, blah, blah. Another thing, because I'm running this, this in, in, in IDE, I will have uh, immediate hints. I know what exactly What's the type of this block in this particular case? There's an ingress backend, and I always have this um, hint here. Um, and I do have a type for this spec. I have a type for this metadata object. And metadata object is common um, resource, common object inside the Kubernetes API. Now, another thing. Remember, oops, sorry, too fast. Remember uh, the his, uh, story of this uh, version? Uh, how this would be interpreted as a string, and after that string would be turned into a number. Um, we do have uh, ways how we can enforce types, and we can say, hey, this particular thing, this service port, this actually would be number, and when we're providing this, uh, the, this helper method that we can provide either string, if we want to inject this from somewhere, like we might have a, um, some of the um, um, parameters, this function, we can put this here. Uh, so we have this stuff. And also, most important thing, like this thing would be validated during compilation and it would get meaningful compilation error, saying that this particular type doesn't get this particular parameter. Um, so once again, doesn't it doesn't look much of a different um, except this probably this part, but we will talk about this in a, in a, a few more minutes. All right, DSL generation. Who get the reference? Do we have a mature people who know what is this? What is that? It's a DSL modem, specifically ADSL. So 
Okay. okay. But, but you get the idea, right? Um, so um, the cool thing that uh, pretty much every language, and Java is also a language, has um, libraries that you can talk to Kubernetes natively. So we're using here is called the Fabricate, which is a part of, um, uh, I guess, Red Hat team started this project to provide Java APIs to Kubernetes so you can actually talk through your application using Java or any JVM language for that matter uh, to talk to Kubernetes natively. And like all these APIs that we, all this beauty and all this heavy lifting as a matter of fact done by Fabricate. Um, so Fabricate provides this Java API. So the only thing that we need to do here is just uh, generate a, uh, the Kotlin DSL out of these types. You know, because it would be cool if we need to like, write this uh, manually, but hey, you know, there's, a, there's a hundreds of API objects, so, and like, every time writing stuff for it would be kind of tedious. So the project that I will be talking about will include certain tools that allows to us to keep uh, library up to date with uh, regardless what kind of version of Kubernetes we're running. Um, and another thing is that, that I will be ta talking about is um, it's good when we have libraries like a Fabricate that allows us to talk to standard API components, components that are provided by Kubernetes vendors. But sometimes, or not sometimes, um, these days, uh, um, concept of custom resource definitions becoming very popular, and this is the way how you can build your new software that runs inside this uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes system. So custom resource definition allows you to create your own resource that will describe your domain. In our particular case, we created this custom resource called Kafka cluster. So we want people to not think about low-level building blocks. They need to deploy Kafka cluster with three nodes. We have a custom resource. and. Uh, Custom resource also will be having this API calls, but Fabricate doesn't know anything about this. Uh, so our library actually handles uh, generation of um, the strongly typed uh, language DSL based on the custom resource definition that comes from different languages. And Kafka will be used here as one of the examples. Um, and uh, actually, this custom resource definition uh, will be handled by custom controller, and custom controller will be responsible for dealing with um, providing low-level details. If you want to learn more, I will be doing the presentation on um, uh, custom resources and Kafka and all the stuff in, uh, in three something, in three o'clock. So not the next session, but the after. So, let's take a look. What we're using uh, from Kotlin? So we're using builders. Very cool, uh, very cool feature that uh, Kotlin uh, uh, borrowed from uh, from Groovy. As we know, builders were available. So builders allows us to build this kind of like a nice uh, looking blocks, so we can do this kind of uh, um, uh, in, 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 uh, kind of defining this block that will be passed around, so we can use this one. Um, and this is part of this ingress, um, um, ingress uh, function that uh, is also like generated. So in this particular case, um, also next thing we're going to be using is extension function. So for particular uh, this ingress spec, we're providing the extension function that allows us to pass their um, uh, backend, uh, ingress backend uh, object. So we're using this one. And this stuff is also generated. Um, so um, you, as you might see, it might be not look as a, like idiomatic Kotlin because we're using like names with underscores. But because we're generating some stuff, it really doesn't matter. Um, and uh, the, the to outside world, you will get this like nice looking thing will be exposed. But um, and there's always there were problems with like name collisions. So that's why we get to um, be like smart about how we call call our like this else. For example, you can say, oh, this is why you have this like new ingress because uh, it might have a collision with the um, the classes how they called inside uh, inside the API. So, um, so demo is available here. Uh, this is my uh, uh, GitHub repository. I will show you, and I guess it's just a time for me to do some typey typey stuff, um, and. Um, I will quickly, uh, quickly show you how does it uh, look like. So let me try and just do this. Um, do not disturb. Okay. Um, and um, I'm going to my my ID. 
So this is application, it's actually a microservice application that includes two components. There is a kind of emulation of ride sharing app and these two microservices are talking to each other through Kafka. So a lot of things needs to be handled here um, because I'm using map uh, service that will be um, using to display like the, the, the maps. Um, I will be dealing with external system. External system requires me to have um, secrets so I can talk to this, uh, to this API. So a lot of things my application require um, in order to configure. So uh, let me show you some of the uh, build scripts that I'm using. So first thing, I need to deal with uh, creating application config. So application config, because it's a Spring Boot application, I need to create this uh, application.properties um, that, first of all, will be using my secret. Um, it also will be uh, converted, not just uh, application.properties uh, on somewhere on the file system. I cannot do this. So in, in, in the world of Kubernetes, I need to also convert this into secret. So I need to get the res resource from my, uh, from my computer and turn it into Kubernetes object. The way how I'm doing this, so I'm massaging some of the um, some of the properties in order to um, um, like it will be spring compatible. But the cool thing here is, is uh, this this moment. This is how I'm defining actual secret in my application. The secret uh, where all the content of my application that property will be injected. Um, in order to you to show what I'm talking about, uh, the properties. Uh, application.properties looks like this, you know? So, couple things. Um, and uh, this is something that will be injected uh, during runtime. Um, and another thing, there is no, um, there's no information about, uh, about Kafka here. So, we need to, you know, get this somehow. So, we're creating this uh, secret. Um, and, um, Cool thing is that we can use any type of like frameworks that we're using. So it's in this case, I just uh, use Kotlin uh, standard tools in the property files. So I don't need to write the parser for my property files because uh, the parser for the property is available in Java and available in Kotlin. So it is pretty nice. So um, let me actually show you um, how this thing uh, it looks like. Let me do full screen. All right, um, where's my application? Let me do this one in the first. So first thing is um, k get secret. We'll see if we have any secrets. I do have a bunch of secrets, but uh, there's no secrets for, for, my, for my application. Um, the secrets is just a common way how you can put some of the sensitive information they're not, the secrets are not like a 100% protection from like something will, will leak, but at least it gives you like a, uh, not a plain text. It's even base 64 encoding. It's kind of sort of plain text, but still um, not, uh, you need to understand what, what it looks like. So what are we doing here? Again, I'm uh, using Gradle because it's my build tool for my application. So I can use this tool in my CI CD pipeline and I can, after I build my application, I can actually create certain configurations. So when I click here, again, I provided some base configuration and also uh, now my DSL goes there and uh, it actually creates, um, goes and check if there is a Kafka cluster available, see? Um, it found available uh, Kafka cluster and was generate and uh, generated some of the properties. If I will take a look on my uh, get secrets, um, this is my application file. So if I will take this guy, uh, just copy paste, and I'll just do base 64 encode uh, decode. I have a decoder and uh, I'll just go here, just whatever first thing Google shows me. This is how I'm doing life choices and I'll do decode. And this is my application dot properties. So as you can see, some of the things that were generated uh, at the runtime and because my uh, DSL was able to also interrogate custom resource, uh, I was able to get some of the information about connection strings. So the, how, 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 this is, uh, how did it happen? 
So first of all, if I do, um, um, if I do this kube control get uh, CRDs, I will see a bunch of stuff. And specifically, I will see this Kafka cluster CRD. I'll do k get Kafka. So in this particular case, it gives me custom resource that I can interrogate through API because I know how to map to this uh, custom resource. And one of the things that I know from my status and internal clients, this is my connection string. So I need to extract this one, massage this in order to spring understand this and put this here. So now my application already will have my configuration file. So what I can do here, uh, I'll use Gradle deploy. So in this case, I will um, take the image. So let's, uh, while it's deploying, I will show you application deployment. So um, K-Lift, the application called K-Lift because it used Kotlin and it looks like a lift. Uh, so this is what you have it. Um, this is how I'm defining my deployment for my, uh, for my application. And as you can see here, I can also define a base deployment because in my organization where I'm uh, deploying this application, I do have certain uh, rules in terms of like uh, how I need to provide some default labels in order my like operation people would set up the proper monitoring and things like that. And you know what? I just noticed a couple things here. So for example, in this particular case, in this particular case, in this particular case, I have a repetitive thing. And because it's my programming language and I run this in my like uh, IDE, so I can always uh, go and uh, refactor here, right? So I can go, um, let's do this one. I replace three occurrences, call it default labels. And this is how I, you know, refactor my deployment files. And the good thing about this, if I make some mistake, first of all, IDE shows me. And another thing, I will compile this and my compiler will give me, you know, specific place where I messed up, all right? So it is my base deployment and I'm going back to my, um, to my application deployment. Um, I'm creating this deployment and I also mapping the secret inside my application. I'm saying that I'm setting this environment variable where my application would know how to connect to this uh, spring and things like that. And after that, I'm creating uh, or uh, removing deployment. As you can see here on my side, I have a number of pods running. This is my pod. Um, if I will do here and say k get deployment, um, I will see a bunch of deployment. In this particular case, my k lift this is my deployment that I'm going to be, um, um, I'm gonna be interrogating. So now let's take a look um, because I didn't provide the external access. Let me do k okay, get, um, oh, sorry, port forwarding k, okay, port forwarding kpf. Okay, and because it's a port, it would be different name. Okay. Um, the next thing is that um, let me create a new, new window and another new window. I will show you that uh, two apps side by side. So if I'll go here, localhost 1990, my rider, localhost 1990 driver. So as you can see, uh, things working right now. So this is the location, my driver. I see this is my UI and the location of my uh, rider. So like when I'm here, say I wanna go somewhere, Peach Street Center. Sounds like a fun place to be. So my, uh, as you can see on the driver screen, it sees this, this, this user guy. So I can go here, click and uh, it works. These two application screens, they synchronize through the Kafka and uh, all this deployment was provided in Kotlin, application written in Kotlin. And I think this is where I get some applause, no? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so uh, let's take a look at another uh, interesting thing. I'm not gonna be uh, doing undeployment, but uh, there is also task as a being a good developer, I'm providing task to, uh, to create, uh, you know, how I can undeploy my application. Another thing that it also um, clean ups after my application because I know my application will require some secrets. I will go clean up secret and after that I find uh, if uh, any containers uh, will be using the same secret, I can find uh, if they not in use. And there's, there's, this is the part of the beauty. So you can uh, see you can, you can do stuff with your infrastructure with real code um, and uh, do things. So I think it's a, it's a pretty, um, pretty neat. Um, benefits here, 
you can always write a testing uh, test for your deployment. Uh, also a cool, cool part of it. And so let's see yeah, if the application is, is working. Uh, and it's still working. Where's my car? Still going. So it's, it's in the real time. Um, I don't see why I don't see car here. Um, not everything working. So let's, let's try this again. Maybe we will be um, happy uh, next time when we will refresh it. Let's do this again. Um, I'm going to this okay, here. Uh, this is a phantom, phantom rider. Um, okay, now I see car. Car is here. Is it moving? Is it moving? Is it moving? Moving? No? 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 Not moving. Anyway, so probably some of the, you know, JavaScript error that I don't know. So this is, um, this is how it looks like. If you want to learn more about this and how these things uh, you know, work inside, uh, feel free to check this, uh, the project on the GitHub. Um, it's uh, uh, totally freely available. You can see how the generator works. Um, so this is what I said, like you can apply certain ideas from this, from this uh, like Kubernetes deployment. Um, and the project, this, this project came out of necessity uh, that um, dealing with the large-scale uh, deployments in the multiple organizations will require some of them, you know, um, like heavy lifting. So that's why instead of having a bunch of YAML files, we have a compilable uh, code. So just uh, spend some time to, to learn about these kind of things. Um, the, the awesome conferences, this is why you know, we're trying to, we, we, we like to talk about some of the forward thinking ideas. Um, maybe something that I just showed today, maybe it's not super clear, maybe something is uh, because of the format of the presentation was not um, uh, precisely um, meet some of the expectation, but you're gonna love this, or if you're not, your kid's gonna love this. Because this is where we're going, we're going with the operators, uh, we're going into the way how we can declare domains that well, we have a certain expertise, or like a vendor has certain expertise of providing, and after that, uh, we can uh, work on some domain-specific languages. So if you have any questions, um, you probably learn about my Twitter handle because it was strategically placed on every slide. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, how many of you have uh, Twitter, actually? Okay, so the, for those of you who don't have a Twitter, Twitter is this, this like social network, like President of the United States uses Twitter a lot. So highly recommend, it's a cool stuff. How many of you have an email? Email, anyone? Okay, email. So if you have any questions, shoot me email. I'm Victor at Confluent. If you have any other questions around Kafka and the Kubernetes and other stuff, we actually have a community Slack where you can join and, and get your questions answered. I will see some of you on my next session, not the next one, but the uh, on three o'clock session. Thank you so much for your time. And I am available for uh, enhanced interrogation for some other questions. Thank you. <laughs> so when there is no questions, I assume there's two things is everything is clear and nothing is clear. And for me as a speaker, it's very difficult to understand which is which. Yes, sir. Uh, to me, this, this feels a lot like uh, uh, when we used to do text, we, when we used to generate from XSV. Exactly, exactly. Yes, so uh, the, this feels exactly like this. And like sometimes when the people bashing XML about these kind of things and saying, hey, yeah, we did like a lot of things. Yeah, but this a lot of things were done right and uh, you will have a lot of things generated, a lot of things out of the box, like validation, code completion, and all this kind of stuff, yeah. Um, yes, XML was quite verbose. Maybe the underlying, the transport were not that, um, like, not ideal, but at least not that sophisticated as we have right now, so we're thinking about speed more and things like that. Um, I guess the new generation of developers that come in, they already don't remember this hell that we went through with uh, like EGBs, Corba, and all this, uh, the technologies. And this is why they're reinventing this stuff right now, using the cool technologies, Go, YAML, and whatever. So how are they handling the, the namespace traffic? In, uh, in the code or in, the, in w w which, which namespace cluster? Yeah, what's 
Yeah, so um, in, 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 in the concept of Kubernetes, there is no per se. You can define like namespace where you're running your, your, um, your deployment. So you use the actual namespace. So uh, right now, like my particular, this demo particular, I created namespace in my cluster that use namespace called operator. So, and all my pods running there. So if you can see in my. This cuts the resource down, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in this particular case, instance of this guy. So I will look, say, deployment, uh, deployment. So in this particular case, I'm specifying that I'm creating this client that will be connected to this namespace uh, called operator. So in this case, I can just do, um, say, so right now it shows me only pods in this operator namespace. So when I when I creating this command, see I'm specifying namespace like operator. If I'll do um, like um, key get pods from all namespaces, I'll get like all pods from all namespaces. That will include some of the system namespace. That will include some of the um, user namespace. So yeah, you can you can have a namespace, but there's no. Like resource isolation, kind of, sorta. There is certain like a limitation in terms of like what available, what's not available. For example, within namespace, uh, the networking is much more simplified than over if you're trying to communicate different port in the different namespace. There are ways how we can do this uh, in Kubernetes, but um, this is um, best what we have right now. All right, so uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, thank you so much for spending the, this, uh, this hour with me, almost hour. So um, go refresh yourself and be prepared for the next talk. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs>